Well, I, I, I hardly know what to say after introductions like that, and it is such a privilege to be able to speak to the, the incoming class to the Clinton School, because I think that one of the things that is of, of utmost importance and one of the reasons that I, I try to channel this talk a little bit towards what I think is going to have to happen in terms of public policy uh, in, in dealing with disasters like this. And uh, they've also, it's, some of it has changed a little bit. I'm going to have to wing some of this because some of you may know that there was some new information came out this morning, and I will address that because I, I actually had it ahead of time. Uh, if we can turn the lights down a little bit and make the slides a little bit easier for people to see. Can we do that? If not, I don't care. I can see them. I've seen them before. <laughs> okay. Um, the first thing that I wanted to tell everybody, and this is extraordinarily important because I think that I and people like me in the media have, have done a disservice in some ways to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I, I'll have some more pictures, but what I want you to see are these regions. You have this Floridian side over here. There is a northern Gulf of Mexico, and what I wanted to point out is that the spill occurred right about here. And the impact zone, this is called Cape San Blas, uh, Destin, Panama City area in Florida. This is certainly the panhandle of Florida. As you might notice, it should have been Alabama. See, they, they, somebody made a gross error, but <laughs> at any rate, um, <laughs> the, the, the point being is that this, this, this is called the Mississippi Bight. And this line is real also. This is the head of the DeSoto Canyon, and this will become an issue for us in a minute. But so the point I wanted to make is that this was never the death of the Gulf of Mexico. And I, and I think we let this be said by the media from the outset. And it was simply never true. It's not true now, and it, and it never will be, because the Gulf, as you can see, is absolutely enormous. Uh, and before I leave this map, I, I want to say that I'm going to talk about the Ixtoc spill in Mexico, which was in the Bay of Campeche, which was way down here, but ran for 10 months before it was closed and did impact the South Texas coast. And that's been the only learning lesson we had. We have no experience with oil uh, spills like this uh, until that time. Now, you don't need to read this. Don't panic. This is from me. The slides sort of keep me on track. Okay. This is biodiversity, and this says Northeast Continental, Southeast, Gulf of Mexico, Pacific Hawaiians, California, High Arctic. If you look down here, number of species, Gulf of Mexico and biodiversity, that says 15,000. Nothing else is like it. So the Gulf is extraordinarily diverse, extraordinarily valuable. And it took a hit, there's no doubt. April 20th, uh, 2022nd, uh, we've seen these images before. There are so many issues about uh, BP not addressing this, not obeying the regulations that existed, cutting corners uh, in every way, shape, and form, and rushing the whole problem. Uh, nobody is without blame. There is one of the issues that has come up is that in this firefighting was not coordinated. There is, is one opinion that we sank the rig by poor firefighting techniques. So uh, the Coast Guard's got a bit of that blame to go around. So th this, this started the problem. There's no doubt about that. As we look at the history of the oil spills, now I did this slide before it was capped. Uh, it really never went quite 100 days, but this will give you an idea of the history. And I tried to make up the difference between, everybody now knows there's 42 barrels, uh, 42 gallons in a barrel, uh, and it's hard to multiply things by 42, but I tried to do it. I'll tell you the worst thing is that the real report, the, the, the report that to, no, talks the most about oil in the sea was done by the National Research Council. Uh, division of the National Academy of Sciences, they had the unmitigated gall to use metric tons. <laughs> now, and metric tons are multiplied by seven. Other than multiplying seven by seven and seven by ten, I can't multiply anything by seven by that. So we don't even go to the metric ton side of it. But at any rate, the, uh, I think that this is what they looked like. Okay, and I think the issue with Ixtoc is that it was the first oil well blowout. See. Amoco Cadiz and the Exxon Valdez were known volumes of oil on the surface. We didn't have to deal with the water column itself, and we had enough problems with those. Ixtoc was a blowout very similar to the uh, Deepwater Horizon, with the exception that it was in 200 feet of water. 200 feet of water is much, much more accessible. Deepwater Horizon is in 5,000 feet of water. That's a mile, okay? We, man doesn't operate down there. We have to depend on the automated uh, underwater vehicles, the AUVs. Who's going to stop it? This, this is very frustrating to me. Um, 
the, and I, I love this image. And uh, I'm not going to ask anybody, how many have ever heard of King Canute? Just raise your hand. I just, yeah. Okay, that's cool. That's all right. King Canute was a Dane who was the king of England about the 11th century. And there's a famous legend about Canute. One was that he was incredibly vain, and the other was that he was incredibly intelligent. But so the story goes that in order to demonstrate one or the other to his courtiers, he took the, the throne down there and put it at the intertidal zone and proceeded to, one, either show how stupid he was by trying to stop the tide because he was the king of England, or to demonstrate to his courtier, courtiers how intelligent he was because only God could control the tides. And I, I thought that this picture was meaningful because we're in a position, and I'll come full circle on this at the end, that like it or not, no matter what you think, federal government never had and probably will not have the capacity to stop one of these blowouts. In our, in our world, only the industry has the capacity to do that. Um, the Coast Guard has, has been singularly inept in a lot of this. The next thing that happened is what I mentioned earlier. The media jumped on this, as they should. Uh, we, we had, the, that's, that's the east end of Dauphin Island, and we had every international broadcasting corp. I even did an a interview in, with Al Jazeera, you know, and, and, and they were great. They were very professional. There wasn't any problem with it. The only thing is that they were, I think, a little offended because I wouldn't let them uh, do the interview in front of Senator Shelby's center there at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. I didn't think the senator would appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> we did ask the question, now this is interesting, and this, there's a point to this. We had Spanish people, we had Spanish uh, team there, we had a French team, I got a French team coming tomorrow, I think. They, and we asked, why, what, what is the international interest in this? Why are you so concerned about it? And the story we got from the French team was that in response to oil spills like the Amoco Cadiz, and uh, there was historic problems with oil, is one of the reasons that France went to nuclear power and power so much of the country with nuclear power because they recognized decades ago that there were some problems if we were going to be completely dependent on oil. Um, throughout this, there have been all kinds of reactions from the media. Um, this one kills me. This absolutely destroys me. I did a, I did a radio interview uh, just a few days ago, and, and things were looking better, you know, and the, the well was capped, and, and, and the federal government had pronounced that it was over, that 75% of the oil was, quote, gone. And I was doing my regular radio interview with the group in Birmingham, and all of a sudden the host starts saying, I knew it, I knew it. Rush was right all along. Rush said this was just a natural phenomenon and the ocean would deal with it, and I knew Rush was right. I had to look it up. For those who can't see it, there's a Russian proverb that says a blind pig finds a mushroom every now and then. <laughs> okay, all right. I, actually, I love that. It was, but, and I did manage to get that on the radio before they cut me off. Uh, when we started this, these are the habitats of the Gulf Coast that were of most concern to us and, and, and drove a lot of the decision making. Um, we have beaches that uh, everyone has seen, which are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Alabama, Mississippi Barrier Islands, uh, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, we have marsh areas. This is emergent marsh, uh, among the most productive kind of habitat in the world. 95% of all the seafood in the Gulf of Mexico spends part of its life cycle in the marshes and estuaries of the central Gulf Coast. So this is extraordinarily important. Grass beds. Tremendous habitat, much more fragile than the marshes. Uh, we've lost a lot of both marsh and grass beds. We're trying to restore a lot of those. And this, this mess down here, this is oyster reef. And oysters are, constitute a major, major seafood for the central Gulf of Mexico. And these are the habitats we were worried about. There's another one that's less familiar to people. There is a <coughs> gulf weed is a floating brown alga. That, li that exists just floating free in the Gulf of Mexico, a completely different kind of habitat, densely populated by pelagic fishes, the young of pelagic fishes, dolphin, uh, swordfish, things like this. And this is going to obviously be and was, in fact, oil during the process. That, that is our research vessel, and that's not oil, that is sargassum. That is a patch of live sargassum that looks like this underneath. <coughs> and this is our boat, the, the E.O. Wilson. 
Um, this, this is an important picture, that, so those that can see it. This is the three dimension of the Gulf of Mexico. The star is the site itself. Now you can see this deep canyon that comes in. This is Pensacola Bay right here. This is uh, Perdido Bay, Mobile Bay. Uh, this is Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Bourne. This is the mouth of the Mississippi River right here. Time and distance is the savior for this part of the Gulf of Mexico. This thing is spouting oil at 5,000 feet down. Louisiana was hit because they're only about 30, 40 miles away from it. And we are clearly a lot further away. Now, unfortunately, this time of year, the net transport is landward in the Gulf of Mexico. So we knew that it was going to be a problem for the area between Cape San Blas and the Mississippi River. This is that Mississippi Bight, and this is called the Mississippi Canyon. So we knew we were in trouble because if it had been winter, the net transport is offshore. It wouldn't have been nearly the problem. But this is also our spawning season out here. The animals spawn in this area, migrate into the estuaries, and, and that's how life works in here. But I need for you to kind of keep track of this particular zone in here because it'll become important based on the controversy that has erupted as of this morning. I want to show you a little bit about what we do. This is Mobile Bay. The Dauphin Island Sea Lab's right here on the east end, right at the mouth of Mobile Bay. It's a, it's a wonderful location. We're on the bay, we're on Mississippi Sound, and we're on the Gulf of Mexico. This site, this little square right here, is nine square miles. And we know more about the nine square miles of the Gulf of Mexico than anybody else in the world because, ironically enough, there was a proposed uh, LNG terminal there by ConocoPhillips. We had a contract five years ago to look at baseline conditions. We know everything that lives in the bottom. Each one of these is a station. We know what the water looks like going down to the bottom. We know what lives on the bottom. We have video from reef structures or, or pipelines in that zone. We have a permanent mooring station. We know how the temperature varies on, a, on different depths. We know about the dissolved oxygen, which is going to become an issue. And we know which way the currents move. This thing down here, it actually measures the currents in the water column. And it's not moving in, in one direction. There will be three different directions, and this is only in about 65 feet of water. Okay. We sample the plankton. I'm going to show you the first data that came out of our laboratory. This thing samples the zooplankton at six different depths in the ocean uh, at these sites. And it's a, it's a fancy rig, it costs $85,000. It makes me nervous every time they throw it over the side. I say, are you going to get it back? You know. Anyway, they, this shows you how it works. Each one of these is a plankton tow, and they're, come, they're pulling a, finely mesh, a fine mesh net that captures everything uh, that is quite small, which means eggs and larvae of all the fish that are out there spawning at that time. And this is what they look like. And this is extraordinarily interesting because the, pic the, the, the jars down here are the settled plant. I don't know what's in it. I'm just saying there's a lot of live stuff there that's been stored now since June of 2009. These samples were taken in, July, in June of 10, just after we got the first oiling. There seems to be very little difference. There's so, no obvious mortality, at least in the first month of exposure. This is all labor intensive. I won't know. I keep telling everybody the second hundred days we'll know a lot more. We put to, to emphasize the regional area of this, these are tracks from drogue buoys that actually one of our classes uh, dropped offshore. And it shows this thing is becoming a big puddle out here. And that, that's the thing that is of some concern to us is that it, we knew it was going to move back and forth. This is Chandler Sound in Mississippi. This is Mississippi Sound, Bay St. Louis, Gulfport, Biloxi area. Uh, this is, again, the lab is here, City Mobile up here. Um, this, the port of Biola Battery is a major uh, fishing uh, port for the Gulf of Mexico. So we, we've been faced with understanding that as long as this thing spewed the oil, it was going to stay. See, these buoys aren't going anywhere. They're just kind of sloshing back and forth. If the wind blew from the east, it pushed it into Chandelier Sound. If it blew from the south, it pushed it into Mississippi Sound and Mobile Bay. So this was, it was just a foregone conclusion that we were going to have some exposure. Now, the thing that's particularly interesting to us and that the people don't realize, Mobile Bay, Mobile Bay is the second largest watershed by volume in the North American continent to the Mississippi River. 
So we, there's, a, a, there's a potload of water coming down Mobile Bay, and because of the rotation of the Earth, that water moves to the west toward Louisiana. The only thing I've ever predicted right about this whole miserable event was that when it started, I said it's going to hit Chandelure Sound before it hits anything else. And, 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 I think, and I was very confident about that because this water moving to the west coming out of the bay is like you've heard the, the kid's story about uh, toilets. When you flush them, they turn to the right in the northern hemisphere. Well, that's because of the rotation of the earth. And it, even we haven't screwed up the rotation of the earth yet. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was a no surprise to me, uh, but I was gratified. Dauphin Island saw very little oiling. We had a little bit in eastern Mississippi Sound, but the further west you went, the more oil there was. So it, it's an issue of, of time and distance. The further away you are and the longer it takes, the better off you are, because this oil starts to weather. And I'm not sure that I still have gotten anybody to give me exact definition of weathered oil, but as soon as it hit the water, 5,000 feet down, it began to change. And that, of course, is part of the problem. How do you deal with a chaotic situation that's changing literally by the minute? And it took some, it take hours for it to get to the surface. So is the material that hit the surface the same as the material that came out of the mouth of the pipe? The answer is no. And this is, this is what's challenging the scientific community at this point. This is what we're worried about, and I, and I realized doing this thing last night, I don't have a fish larvae to show you, but these are, these are fish eggs now. Actually, that is probably a fish larvae in there. These are copepods. They live in the plankton all the time. They're probably the most important animal on the face of the earth because everything eats copepods. This is a crab larvae. All these suckers are microscopic. I mean, you could see them with your eye in a jar, but you can't see this kind of detail. They are susceptible to the, the toxic components of the oil. There has almost certainly been mortality amongst this life stage of the fish and the invertebrates and the shrimp and the crab and the red snapper and the gulf grouper and all the things that are spawning out there right now. Those things made up that settled mass that you saw in the jars and, and, and 55 other species. The point being is that these guys would be in the harvest for seafood. Most of these would, well, actually the copepods aren't, but they are the food for everything else. So we're, we're worried about mortalities at this level of the life cycle itself. And there will certainly be a short-term impact in seafood in, in this part of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we began saying, what is it? And, and it is a messy looking thing. It, it was a huge block of, of asphalt that we caught in on the, we caught, found it 33 miles south of the island in late June. And the sense of it was nobody knew what it was. My, my beloved Coast Guard people on the island said, oh, it's a tar ball. Well, I knew it wasn't a tar ball. I'd, we've been seeing tar balls for years and years and years. Tar balls are a natural feature in the Gulf of Mexico. This was not a tar ball. So finally, we, we sort of decided, well, maybe it's a, it's a chunk off of the platform, the Deepwater Horizon, when it in fact burned and exploded and it was floating on the surface. This, this is an anomaly. Uh, we actually saw more of this kind of material, but, and it is of oil. It, it came from the oil. One of the petroleum experts from LSU opined that it is, um, the, the, the crude oil, amongst the things that it has in it, it, contains a lot of asphalt. Not necessarily a lot of asphalt, but it contains asphalt. And this looks like it was asphalt. Um, now, a few days later, we did strike oil. I mean, it was, it was amazing the differences. These, these are tar balls. This is what we've seen before. Now, one of the things you have to understand, this becomes critical to the discussion. The, the Gulf of Mexico has had oil in it for millions of years, okay? The nat there are natural seeps in the Gulf. In fact, the last estimate that I'd seen was from about 2000, so it's been 10 years ago. They estimated half a million barrels of oil naturally leaking into the Gulf of Mexico. Half a million barrels every year leak into the whole Gulf of Mexico from 600 different sites. So that's a lot of oil except that it's scattered over a long time and a lot of area. So it, it, the Gulf has adapted to that. There is a microbial community down there that looks on crude oil like we look at donuts. It's, it's carbon. It's carbon. Uh, we got we carbon that looks like celery. It's still carbon. And that's what the microbial community eats. And they eat virtually all of it. 
So there's an adaptive capacity in the Gulf to deal with oil, even the toxic parts of oil. So th that, that potential for dealing with this has been there from the beginning. And I'm one of them that said, I think it will be resilient. I think that we can deal with this. Uh, after the Ixtox spill 30 years ago, the Texas scientists uh, felt that the system had largely recovered in three to five years. So that was the figure that I used when people said, well, how long is it going to, if you think it's so resilient, how long will it take? So I think it, the only experience we have says maybe three to five years. Uh, it's not fair to extrapolate Exxon Valdez to the Gulf of Mexico terribly different ecosystem, a, a system that's used to oil, a system that's <laughs> darn hot, <laughs> I can tell you right now. But that heat speeds up everything. So the, the, the players were in place to deal with the spill. The question was always, how long will it take? Will it take weeks, months, years? How long will it take to deal with this? Um, we, we also got, I'm not going to go into that one, now, forgive me. This is, um, these are pictures of emulsified oil south of Dauphin Island, and there, there's some important observations to, to make about this. First of all, I, I will readily admit that in the first week, and I wasn't alone in this, we sort of imagined, is there going to be this paving of the top of Gulf of Mexico with oil? Is it going to be this uniform, black, thick mess over hundreds of square miles? You know, the fish can be down there looking at them saying, Damn, it's been dark a long time, you know? <laughs> but it's up there, you know? And, well, anyhow, the first thing that we noticed was it was really chaotic. It, it, it's nothing uniform about it. Not only has the wretched stuff changed its chemical composition, but it's gotten all kinds of goofy-looking things. So we had different colors. We had, I had a BBC firm tell me that it would look like cornflakes. Oh, that, that's a new one, you know? But it did mat. But, what we still don't know is that, I don't know if the stuff over here in the water is dead. I don't know, I, I kind of guess it's dead if it's in there, but is it, is it toxic over here? We still don't have answers. One of the things we were concerned about, the reason we've got this bay anchovy revealing his all to you, those are gill rakers. Anchovy and menhaden are main forage fish in the Gulf, and they feed just by filtering the water. They don't care what's in front of them. If it's little and it fits, they grab it. So, they, they are exposed and they are a food fish and, and this is one of our areas of concern. But we have had very few reports of big fish kills. And, and if they were, at this time of year, it could be just the heat and the oxygen problems. Um, we saw a lots of different patches and colors and things and this is what they worry about getting in the marsh. And it, it was also uncertain. We know that the waves, just physical waves, emulsify the oil. So they, they, they froth it up and they make it change. Nobody's been able to tell me, well, does the dispersant make it emulsify faster, slower, better, worse? You know. And I, there must have been 17 different morphs of weathered oil described to me. And never with any, you know, well, is it toxic? And the chances are, by the time it spends two weeks or three weeks or a month in the water, it's probably largely not toxic. But at any rate, um, this, this is the, right now probably the most burning technical question involved with the whole wretched incident. Dispersants, <laughs> the technical logic on dispersants is good because they are meant to break the oil thing into small bite-sized particles, bacteria-sized bite-sized particles. And this will increase the rate of biodegradation because it's like eating a little sampler hamburger as opposed to a three-pound hamburger. It just goes faster. So, that was always understood. They were used with some success at Exxon Valdez. And they started out using it on the surface, spraying it from airplanes. The, to the dispersant is toxic. It's just about like oil. But if it will cause the spill to degrade faster, then it might be worth using. And I don't know that their decision is in on that yet. But I had it explained to me just yesterday, in fact, that this process is very inefficient. What is efficient, 
This is dispersant being applied to the oil spill at 5,000 feet in the bottom in the Gulf of Mexico. And apparently that is very efficient. That's why they wanted to use it at depth. Now, the problem that I have is that, follow my thinking here, okay? It creates a microscopically small droplet of some version of oil so that the bacteria can get at it. That's a good thing. It creates, according to the petroleum bio, uh, hydrocarbon uh, engineers at LSU, it creates a neutrally buoyant microscopic particle. Now, neutrally buoyant means that it's neutrally buoyant. To me, I, that means it's going to go nowhere. It does go up because of what they call the jet phase. So it got shot up out of this, out of this plume right here, and it, it went until it ran out of steam, and it sat there as a neutrally buoyant microscopic particle waiting for bacteria to eat it. Unfortunately, the bacteria happened to need oxygen to eat it, and there's not a lot at 3,000 feet, and it took several hundred years for it to get there in the first place. So we've, we've created a problem that we do not know how much oil is in the Gulf of Mexico. They know how much they skimmed. They have a rough estimate of what they burned. They have a model estimate of what they think evaporated on the surface. And no one seems to know how much got dissolved in the Gulf. And now we don't know where it is in the Gulf. So we don't know what's there, we don't know its concentrations, we don't know what percentage of toxics may be there, we don't know how to find it. Well, we do know how to find it, but it's not easy at 3,000 feet down in the Gulf of Mexico. So, uh, as I told one of the interviewers earlier today, uh, the BBC, the, the British have such a command of the English language. They, I heard this on, on the BBC, on N NPR. They said that it had introduced a profound uncertainty. <laughs> and I did. I said, Damn, the Brits know how to use the English language. <laughs> um, and and that, that is where we are with the oil now, is this enormous debate. And I, now I'm getting into the part that I've done new, I think. Okay, yeah, here. Th this is the idea. In other words, this is kind of crude, but the, the point being is that it rises like you would see a smokestack coming out of a, of a, of a chimney on a factory, and it reaches some point where it's at the same density that it's in the atmosphere, and it just sort of takes off whichever way the wind seems to be blowing and then it gradually disappears. Now that's the same thing we could be facing with the plume. And, and the problem is that this is simplified. If this has got a current going in one direction, what happens if you've got 5,000 feet and you have four different currents going in four different points of the compass? How are you gonna find that sucker now? 3,000 feet down, not, not an easy task. How are you gonna calculate the toxicity associated with that plume? In other words, let's, let's, let's play that that's what that plume looked like right there. Well, is it toxic three feet away from it? It was six miles long, I'm sorry, six miles wide, 22 miles long, and maybe 100 feet deep is what the, the, the group from, uh, on the Pelican, an oceanographer from Georgia, one from Southern Miss, and the boat was from Louisiana. We, we get along in the Gulf. Um, if you don't keep it in the Gulf, you do wind up with tar like this. This is, this is late June on Horn Island. This is material that was cleaned up. Um, I, I, prom I forgot this was in here. I wasn't gonna do any dead birds because it, certainly there have been plenty of mortality in birds. The, the point is that if, we're, if we still had this, then we get into the issue of cleanup. Now, I think I made the point before. The federal government doesn't know how to stop this thing uh, obviously, nobody was really prepared to contain it and skim it. We learned a lot about that. So BP was charged, and I'll, I'll get into the policy issue of this in just a minute, with cleaning up the oil when it got into the estuaries and when it got on the beaches. Well, I made a lot of enemies in Florida because I said, let it go to the beaches. The beaches are easy to clean. The beaches are not all that productive. They Mostly, they grow tourists. <laughs> you know. So. Uh, that made me some enemies with the beach people, but, but, but it's still true, nevertheless. Um, so we get into this cleanup mode. Now everybody got, I'm sorry, I've got this, in, that, that's the governor of Alabama at our lab. Uh, that's the head of NOAA. Uh, I would let my picture be taken in front of the Shelby Center with the head of NOAA, if not for Al Jazeera. Um, and the president visited. 
and we've had the best time. We photoshopped every, lo every scientist at the lab into that space right there. <laughs> um, but, you know, everybody wanted to see it. There, there were lots of stories in Louisiana. Uh, BP would have crews out cleaning right in front of the president. In Alabama, I'm sorry, this one's a little dark, uh, the, the, the governor decided that the thing to do was to put booms around everything. Boom it. If it didn't move, they boomed it. We must have had 40 miles of boom uh, around everything. They even built this, this big steel boom thing in the mouth of Perdido Bay that lasted through one storm and it was gone too, along with the rest of the boom. So boom is, is a nice touchy-feely thing. Maybe, people, maybe it makes people feel better. This is, this is what drove everybody nuts. It was the people. I, I, will, I will tell you, well, I've got a picture. I mean, they're, they're picking tar balls up by hand. Uh, they got crews standing around waiting to go out on the beach. The National Guard put all these things on the north side of Dauphin Island. That didn't make it through the first storm either. They all went away. And then they got these poor saps in Louisiana with mops trying to pick this stuff up. Uh, you know, it's just, it was just nuts. And there were lots of these stories. They, they really did not let them work but 20 minutes an hour. And this is Dauphin Island. This is the beach at Dauphin Island. And they sit under the tent, and then about every half hour or so, they'd, they'd line up, and then they would march in single file down to the beach, work for 20 minutes, pick up everything they could put in the sack, and go back under the tent. We had, I, I will tell you, that we had 10 pickers per tar ball on Dauphin Island. And to make it worse, I would say we probably had two of the mules, you know, the four-wheel drive do things, you know, for every tar ball. It, it is just, and, and it, you know, and it scared people. I mean, I think this is a Photoshop. I don't think the, mad, the respirator is not real. But I took this picture. In other words, the public not advised to swim in the waters due to the present oral related camp. What, what nonsense. I mean, people would ask me, well, is, it, is it safe to go in the water? And I said, is there tar if you see oil in it, I probably wouldn't go in. But that was one of the things that's so frustrating. You'd have, my boats would go out, they'd go out in the morning and they'd see no oil and they'd go do their stuff. And then they couldn't get back to port because all the oil had blown in. You know, it was just, it's truly chaotic. Um, and, and what all of this did, what all of this did is, is frame the whole thing in, in a truly negative sense. I thought this was classic. For those that can't see it, that's BP signal. The T-shirt says, "We're bringing oil to American shores." I swear to God. <laughs> if anybody knows where they can get one of those, I would pay anything for it. Okay. <laughs> the problem. This is from Louisiana. This is somebody's yard in Louisiana with all the crosses. Again, for those who can't read, sunbathing, crabbing, swimming, uh, trout, Meunier, uh, king mackerel, Gulf breeze, uh, trout, beach, fishery. You know. Um, New Orleans, I'm from New Orleans. There's no place like New Orleans. You know, you get, you get them coming down to the French Quarter and they're, they're demonstrating against BP. Um, we didn't help ourselves. This, this is, as you can see, the government's doing what it does best. It's OSHA that said those people couldn't work but 20 minutes an hour out there on the beach. Uh, we could, and they're picking up tar balls, for God's sake. They could have put a box of gloves out there and there, we, would, we had a thousand people call the lab and want to volunteer to clean the beach. Oh, no, no, do you have to be hazmat trained? Well, it, it just, it sort of gets worse. Anyhow, this is the kind of thing we've seen down there. In other words, the, 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 the public reaction to the whole issue has just gotten terribly out of hand, and I don't, I don't know the solution to that. There's going to be a, a, quite a marketing challenge, I would think. The people went nuts. We get photographs like this at the lab. And all of a sudden, the news media, all, there's oil in Mobile Bay. There's oil in Mobile Bay. Well, we looked at it and see this bayou right here. This is a, a swamp over here in that bayou. That's, those are tannins. Those are just natural products coming out of a swamp after the rain into the bay. But it looks like oil, so it must be oil. I mean, th this has been the, the thing we've been dealing with, with the media and the public down there. And this one tells it all. This one tells it absolutely all. This is, Do this is the beach at Dauphin Island. Now. The girl that turned, this was on the front page above the fold, the Mobile paper. And I said, ah, that's just classic to me. She's from Germany, having a great beach vacation, except for the noodles that are walking by her <laughs> with life jackets on, <laughs> hazmat suits, boots, yellow boots. They all had yellow boots. Now, 
I, I'm sorry it's not dark. This guy is covered with tats, too. I mean, <laughs> this is, I'm not sure where they're finding these people, but they, they clean the beach, and the beach has never been cleaner. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's just the honest to God truth. Um, now, here's, here's the issue. This is the federal report of last week, okay? And NOAA released this based on 5 million barrels of oil, which is pretty close to what I figured originally. Um, they, they said the residual oil includes that on or below the surface, light sheen, weathered tar balls, washed ashore, been collected in shores, buried in sand, and sediments. That is just so misleading. Now, they, down here they got 25% that they think is either evaporated or dissolved. And then there's naturally dispersed. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean it's not dissolved or evaporated? Is that not residual oil? You know, so what, what's happened is that they, and, and one of the things that I objected to vehemently, as you've probably already figured out, when they, when they reported this, they, they credit that massive federal effort. And I'm thinking, please, preserve me from the massive federal effort. Preserve me from the massive BP effort. It was, if, if this thing is over, it's because the microbial community in the, the hot Gulf of Mexico has managed to deal with it. But unfortunately, this came out a couple of days ago and was released, uh, I don't know, the, the problem being is that they, the University of Georgia oceanographer was on the first cruise on the Pelican. And this is a low loss rate and this is a high loss rate. They've taken the same data that NOAA had and they calculate that the residual in the Gulf is 79, 70 to 79%. The, the feds are saying 75% is, quote, gone. They're saying 79%, they said the same amount is still there. And on top of that, we don't know where it is. We don't know the toxicities. We don't know the biodegradation rate. We don't know if it's being assimilated into the food web. That, that profound uncertainty has been uh, really hammered home. And I, I'm sorry, what came out this morning is the University of South Florida has a boat, had a boat over the last 10 days in the DeSoto Canyon. You remember my little thing sticking up toward Pensacola? They found oil, or they found fluorescing material that they presume is oil. CNN turned it into a, quote, constellation of oil. Preserve me from the media. Um, but the, the, the feeling is, is that this subsurface oil is now distributed in the deep gulf, but it, when it goes up that canyon head, it's coming to the surface closer to Pensacola. So it, it is impacting the Florida panhandle, in fact, more than it is to the west. However, remember which way I said the water was circulating. It will come west also. So we've, we're, we're facing this enormous uncertainty about how much oil, what kind of oil, what co toxic components, is, there, is it being degraded faster than it's being assimilated? And it's, it's just a nightmare for the scientists. Uh, I, I think that this was the thing that struck me. In the 2003 report from the National Research Council, their answer was this, now this is seven years ago. They said the most serious in terms of fate problems, both shallow and deep water, appears in the limited validation of the dissolved component which is exactly what I think we have to be worried about, uh, whether it's the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or whether it's any of the others, I don't know. What we tried to deal with, yeah, I'm okay. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that, okay. <clears throat> In 1990, after the Exxon, it wasn't really after the Exxon Valdez spill because that was not really settled until about two years ago. But they realized that there were serious problems in the way that they had handled the spill. And Exxon had their scientists working on the spill, and the federal government had their scientists working on the spill, and you can imagine that the differences were rather dramatic. So the intent of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, Open 90, was to avoid that lit litigation conflict and it did also, that, that's when they made them start building double hull tankers. Y'all may remember that. That's, they held single hull until then. Now they all have to be double hull. They mandated contingency planning. And I suspect you've probably heard, or maybe you didn't. Turned out that the contingency plans for all of the companies was virtually the same after this. It wasn't just BP. They all had contingency plans. It somehow we're dealing with walruses in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, I, I, I told somebody else, I think word processing is probably the worst thing that ever happened to planning because you can cut and paste anything now. And if nobody reads it, nobody cares. 
So anyhow, they did create a trust fund. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. They, they increased penalties. They tried to have new R&D, and, and they tried to broaden the financial, and that's part of the problem. This is where it really gets interesting, because everybody, nobody, everybody's mad at the federal government. Why is BP making this decision? Why is BP doing this? Why is BP doing that? Well, it's because of the open 90 that it's doing it. The responsible party has to pay, has to, is liable for the damages and the removal costs. The responsible party can establish the removal costs and damages resulting were caused solely by the act of issue by third, then the third party's held. So it's not just BP, it's Anadarko and it's Transocean. So they're all, all guilty under the act. They created the trust fund. But here's, here's the, the kicker, which is a billion dollars, and they've been paid tax on barrels of oil to fill that, that billion dollars up. It's responsible party. Responsible party. Okay, that's over and over again, it's responsible party. Well, what happened is that they created something called NERDA, Natural Resources Damage Assessment. It's in NOAA. And the law provides definitions of what is injury and what is recovery. But it doesn't tell you how to measure them. It just says if they're injured, they got to fix it, they got to pay for it, and they got to pay for the recovery. So what happened is that they created this brawl between the Exxon objectives and their scientists, and that means Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. The, the state and the feds have a trustee, which are mostly the state and federal agencies. They came up with these different results of the two studies. And the problem, and you, you, we're talking to some of the people about climate change, science is truly aggravating. Scientists question each other. Scientists challenge each other. They always have, they always will. And one thing in the environment, we have never, ever been particularly good at nailing down cause and effects if there are subtle issues involved. So we wound up with 20 years of litigation. And NOAA, as a result, has codified. They, they've written these so-called protocols for this natural resource damage assessment process. And there are three phases. We're in pre-assessment, the trustees. That's us. That's the state and federal government, OK? We got to evaluate the injury, but they never told us how to do it. So now we're right now we're writing protocols. We quantify these potential injuries. We argue about that. We have to implement the restoration. The re trustees and the responsible party. The law makes us a partner with the responsible party and gives the responsible party uh, a, a role to play in doing the assessment because the responsible party is going to pay the bills. Okay, and that, that made some sense 20 years ago. Good, we don't, let me make them pay for it. And let's avoid the litigation issues. Let's not get involved in this again. That's what I meant about it was well-intended policy to try to deal with a disaster like this. I mean, what's not to like about BP paying for it? What's not to like about lawyers not getting rich as a result of, of scientists? I asked, a, I asked a lawyer in Mobile, a friend of mine, a long time, I said, Rick, what are you, what are you going to do with a situation like that? I said, isn't it tough? I said, you got Exxon over here, and they got five scientists, and they're saying one thing, and then you got the, the, the NERDA people over here, and they got six scientists saying another thing. What do you go with? He says, well, I, I don't know, maybe six scientists. Maybe that's better than five, you know. It, it's just very, very hard. And, and I think this, I, I stumbled on this just a, a week or so ago. Craig Peace is an environmental science teaches at a law school, and he wrote a piece in the forum, which is the Environmental Law Institute. And, and this is something that I think applies to, to public service and policy in general, because what we think of the atmosphere in the ocean, and, and probably the ocean is the last great commons. I'm, I'm a great believer in the public trust doctrine. The ocean belongs to everyone. The, the, the stuff in the ocean belongs to everyone. And what I, I, this was the last sentence in his article, and I thought this is really a, an incredibly insightful statement. I think it's at the core of what we're going to have to do to develop a, a better policy. And, I don't, and the easy answer is not going to work, I don't think. But the point being is that he's saying that if, we, if the government that is supposed to, by law, protect the commons, if it has to depend on a, a private sector that has a profit motive driving it, to protect the commons from itself? I, don't, I didn't say that. Do you understand what I'm saying? I was, you, you're going to depend on, oh, I'm sorry, you're going to depend on the fox to feed the chickens? 
You know, I mean, this, this is a really a very core issue in terms of public policy. And the problem that I see is that uh, I, I have read and I understand that the European Union has, quote, federalized their capacity to respond to deep oil well drilling, which they do have in the North Sea. But they have one coast. We have three coasts. How is the federal government, and particularly the way things are now, ever going to be able to afford the capacity to deal with spills on the Gulf Coast, or the Southeast Coast, or the Northeast Coast, or the West Coast? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the European solution won't work. And I don't know what's going to work. But I have already told the congressman in my district and the others that would listen to me that this is going to be the greatest challenge, to try to learn from the mistakes of Deepwater Horizon and, and try to react to the need. Because you're supposed to end these with a nice sunset. I, but I thought, given what we're faced with now, and I'll be glad to take some questions for a few minutes, but I, I think we're dealing with enormous, profound uncertainty about the nature and the threat of what has been discharged into the north central Gulf of Mexico. I think it's going to take a long time for us to, to rebuild the image of Gulf seafood throughout the nation. Uh, I, I think that the, the system itself, I believe, will be fine. I'm not sure that the human dimension is as resilient as the natural system. I believe there will be seafood restaurants in Orange Beach, Alabama next year, but I'm not sure the people that own it now will own it then. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to come to grips with this, because if there, I suppose a couple have asked me already that if there's a silver lining in this, it's not a lining. There might be one thread that maybe this will create the, the recognition that our dependence on hydrocarbon fuels has risks associated with it that we just haven't thought through. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, for, thank you for that. If you do have a question, we do have uh, some microphones that will get, get out to you. This, this one right here came up. We're all familiar with the dead zone in the Gulf, and some of us more than others, I think, maybe know some of the causes of that. Um, you haven't even used those words. What, it's, can you talk about the interface yeah, uh, between those? Uh, thanks. That, that you gave me an opportunity that one of the themes that I forgot, because I don't have it represented on the slides, uh, I, I touched on it. The microbial community consumes oxygen as it degrades the oil, good, bad, or indifferent. And the concern that we have at this point is that at, at depth, at 3,000 feet, there simply is not the kind of oxygen down there. There's not an, anything like the atmosphere. So we're worried about the creation of a midwater dead zone. See, the dead zone in the Gulf that's been described is, is really based on carbon particles falling to the bottom. It's algae and stuff that the nutrients that come from the Arkansas River and everywhere else build up south of the Mississippi River. The stuff died, falls to the bottom, and that carbon begins to consume the oxygen. We're, we've never had to deal with a midwater oxygen de deficient area. And that's one of our real concerns because things that migrate through it may not, if it's, if it's a thousand feet deep, something that's trying to migrate to the surface at night or whatever may not have the oxygen to get through there. And we have, we have seen and documented at the lab low DO, lower DO than we have ever seen before at that oceanographic buoy that I showed you. We, it, we've had it out there five years and never seen oxygen as low on the bottom as we saw the, in June of this year. But it's been very hot. We are, the samples are being measured now to see, well, did the carbon come from the north, come out of Mobile Bay, or did it come from the Gulf? We will know that eventually, but we don't know for sure. It's usual scientific wishy-washy. In other words, we don't know, we couldn't identify oil in there. So it, it's, it's, it's tempting to say it was the oil. But, so our problem right now, somebody above my pay grade is going to have to figure out how much carbon, not, not in metric tons, not in anything, except how much carbon atoms have we dumped into the North Central Gulf, and how many molecules of oxygen will it take to get it completely out, you know? And, and it's, chances are it's not enough, so that just means it's going to go on longer. It will continue to degrade without oxygen, but very slowly. So it's just extending the, the profound uncertainty gets into profound squared. 
One, one second, one second, one second. <laughs> Has there been any like uh, gap assessments or eco regional assessments for that? For the Gulf of Mexico, I know that California has had one, and Southeast Coast is working on one. Um, well, just, gap assessment for what? Well, specific? for the for the coast for the co for those eco regions for those coastal regions, and and how would that affect policy? in, well, in working with this, I, I can't give you specifics other than that there's a, there's a general understanding that the Gulf has never had the kind of of treatment that other parts of the country have. We, we've sucked it dry in terms of seafood and oil. And uh, I think one of the things that's going to be an interesting discussion is that the, the Gulf Coastal states are asking, and not very politely, for a bigger cut of the oil revenues come into the coastal states to better provide for that. And, and one of the, I think one of the very positive things is that the Nature Conservancy and other inst groups like that, and, and for that matter, the state institutions and, and laboratories like mine, are trying to paint this, this particular situation with a brush that will include restoration of things that were actually destroyed over the last several decades that are not attributable to the oil. They're saying, okay, now's the time to fix it. You know, and, and fixing it for this will fix a lot of things. Now, whether they can do it right or not, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll let Nikolai do that. <laughs> I, I have read in the New York Times that there are uh, experiences from West Africa, from Nigeria, where there have been underwater oil spills and uh, that extend into the brackish water and estuarine zones. You haven't mentioned this. Is there a lack of data on those spills? Well, I, I don't know much about it, but my understanding is that's in the Niger Delta. And so that's, that's, a very, that's not a deep water. In other words, that oil is probably pretty much hitting on the surface and staying on the surface. That, that, that I think, is it's a very good question, or at least it points out the fact that the, the, the profound uncertainty at this point is the dealing with this thing in the in middle, literally, the vertical middle, the three-dimensional middle of the Gulf of Mexico or the North Central Gulf that's, that's created this problem. Yeah, the Niger stories are awful, but it, it seems to be land I mean, although it's in the delta, there's a lot of water, but it's not something blowing out of the bottom. It's coming out of the, out of the Niger Delta. Okay. Yeah, uh, the marshes, uh, the damage done, the damage that may be done, do you have an idea yet what magnitude that is, and can that be remediated also? Uh, the, the early reports, and there are reports now, are, are actually looking like because it did not, and this would be particularly Louisiana, only Louisiana and maybe Bay St. Louis and Western Mississippi Sound had significant marsh oiling. It, it didn't penetrate very far, so the edge has been impacted, and the, 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 there's anecdotal reports that it's actually, there's already some green growth showing in some of them that were early impacted in Chandelure Sound, so that, that's looking pretty good. And the Louisiana example is the one where it's a good thing we didn't have a hurricane because that would have probably spread it further around in the marshes. Now, the other thing that's good about the marshes comes back to what we saw in the water. It's not paving over anywhere. In other words, you, if you went to a marsh, except for the edge that's fairly uniformly oiled, you might see a patch of oil over here and perfectly healthy marsh right there. In other words, it was not paving the whole system. And so the, the sense, right, this is going to be one of the probably more important recovery stories is to actually be able to answer that question because I, all I can say is anecdotally they say I saw I did an interview in New Orleans radio and the, the guy says yeah there was green stuff down there you know already so I'm I, we're, we're optimistic about that at this point but I'm sure that in fact the, the, the damage <laughs> ironically the damage to the oyster reefs in Louisiana may be more due to the fact that they flooded them with fresh water trying to keep the oil out and they killed more oysters with fresh water <laughs> than, than the oil did but that would be another story <laughs> Uh, future public policy issues having uh, bearing on the role of government in providing knowledge to cope with these kinds of crises. Would you comment uh, on any a strong sense of distinction between what the government can do with reference to scientific knowledge as distinct from engineering knowledge? I, <laughs> that, you, you touch a nerve. <laughs> um, the, the, the distinction that I think the natural scientist draws from the engineer is that 
the engineer deals in highly predictable uh, phenomena. In other words, engineers can figure out how fast water will flow through a certain pipe or through an estuary, and they can do the physical models. I, I served several years on the Environmental Advisory Board for the Corps of Engineers and developed a, a remarkable understanding of engineering mentality. I, I didn't say respect, I said understanding. Um, the, the, the difficulty is that engineers, they, they operate with predictable quantities, and what we're seeing in the natural system, and this, this instance may be a, a prime example, there are going to be lots of books written about this one, is that it, it borders on chaos. And, and just the, the, the engineers can't grasp that. It, it's not part of standard engineering mentality to deal with chaos. They, they like things to work with formula and, and predictable results. And this has been part of the problem with the Corps, of, and I'm getting into this, the Corps of Engineers doing restoration. They, they don't understand that biological systems are, tend to be chaotic and not perform like a water in a pipe. So I, I, I don't know how to resolve the answer to your question, but there is that distinction is where I see it. And I think that, uh, that what I really don't want to get drawn in, there is an absolute war going on right now between the academic scientists and the federal scientists of NOAA that, that's reflected in those pie graphs that I put up. There is a uh, very, very touchy science policy type issue that's coming in here that we don't know quite how to deal with. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's flaring up and they're trying to get them to talk more to each other. But some of this is driven by the litigious nature of it. In other words, NOAA's getting their data and they are telling scientists that get data for NOAA that they can't publish that because NOAA wants to keep it away from BP so that when they go to court, Meanwhile, BP is taking the data they're getting and doing the same thing. In other words, we, we're recreating the problems of, of Exxon Valdez, despite the, the, the law which put us there trying to avoid it. That's why I say the policy is going to have to take some serious thought. Over there. He's coming around the back to you. Pass that up. Well, I'm an engineer with the Department of Agriculture. There you go. <laughs> I, I, uh, I wanted to ask you a question. So I saw where you had a, a um, chart that showed 3.9 million barrels, I believe. Uh, yeah. The, well, um, anyway, yeah. I've seen estimates where it said some, something like uh, 250 million. But my question is, uh, I saw where some of the, uh, the pressures after they were trying to cap the well were, were about uh, 7,000 pounds per square inch. Right. And I was wondering if we have the technology to handle those kind of pressures at that depth, or we're going to have more problems? Well, that's, that's, I think the simple answer is no, and, and there continue to be reports of new seeps in the area around Deepwater Horizon well, or Macondo well, and that, that's what everybody's been very careful about, was that they not fracture the shelf. I mean, it's hard to imagine 3,000 feet, and I'm, I'm not a, a petroleum engineer, and I, I, I I'm just not aware of how they would deal with that. I know that they think they've got it, it plugged, but in plugging it and in the drilling of the two other wells, in other words, they, now they've drilled three holes in more or less the same area, and, and I'm, I'm just like everybody else, wondering if they've weakened it and let those, that pressure from that well come up through those fractures. Yes, 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 that is. That, they, that, that's, that's why there's been so much criticism frankly, from the industry on BP. They, they knew what they were, they should have known what they were getting into, and that the, the data that's coming out indicates that they used the wrong well, you know, they cut corners, they did everything, they, anything you could do wrong, they basically, they did wrong, and the industry behind the scenes is just furious, because the others, you know, it's like, it's like the kindergarten keeps you keeping all the class in because two kids were bad, you know, <laughs> that's the way the industry feels right now. Look, I'll, I'll repeat your question, I can hear you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sure. The, there were three levels of training. Now, the, I, don't, I don't want to get this story. The guy with the tats, I'm pretty sure that they got the convicts out of the work release center. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I'm sorry. We, we, my lab has these dormitories, and we have people there from all over the state, all over the country. And one morning, early on in this process, my secretary came in and said, Custodio found these guys with tattoos walking around the dorms looking for a bathroom. And I said, well, they, they did what they're supposed to do, because we have all kinds of people. They say, where are you from? They said, Talladega Correctional Institute. And I, I, I had this image of my custodian, who was, happened to be in an air boot at the time, just hot-footing out of that dorm, you know, I <laughs> cast on. And it turned out, uh, so I got mad, and I called the chief of police on Dauphin Island, and I said, we can't have convicts down here in the dormitories. So later on in the day, the, uh, uh, the chief of police went down there, and he, he talked to the BP guy, and my associate director ran into him. He, my director comes in, I'm sitting down the table, he comes in after lunch, and he said, not a problem. He said, the chief talked to the BP guy down there. They don't have any convicts down there. And I, I already knew it because I'd looked them up. I'd found out where they were from. And I said, and, and he said, oh, and don't worry about those white vans that say Alabama Department of Corrections on them. <laughs> we, we bought those, and we just haven't painted BP over them yet. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, this is my beloved associate. I've been together 30 years. Uh, I looked up, and I said, John, think about the words that just came out of your mouth. <laughs> That's a true story. And we got an adjunct to apology from the police chief. Uh, so, anyhow, four hours. They had to take the four-hour training. We had everybody at the lab take the four-hour training. We had some of them take the three-day training. And I, I wish I'm not going to remember it, but my, one of my PhDs came back after the four-hour training and said, you know, how did it go? I've got it on my wall. It said, um, I wasn't qualified to do anything before, and now I have a certificate that tells me that I am qualified to not do anything again. <laughs> ha, ha, as you know, ha, the basic hazmat's pretty, I, I'm glad somebody gets paid for doing it. All right. <laughs> We're gonna go over here. Okay, I'm sorry, here we go. Hello, my name's Heath Carelock. I'm with class six of the Clinton, to your left. Oh, okay. Over by the flag. Oh, way over, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> Hello, class six. It's our, it's our orientation week, so we're very glad to be here. Uh, my question has to do with the boons. You seem to have a disdain or a distaste in your mouth when you said the boons. So was it right to use that many boons? Do you see boons as ineffective? How do you view the boons? Uh, the, the booms, he's asking about the effectiveness of the booms. The booms, there are places where the booms will work. Uh, quiet water, um, where you don't have waves. But I, I, I'm going to forget the details, but a, a current over half a knot goes under the boom. A wave over six inches goes over the boom. So I, I think booms should be used in lakes <laughs> when the wind's not blowing. You know, I, I, but it, you, I, I think it was mostly PR. I mean, it was well-intentioned, and um, there probably were places where it was the right thing, but half of them got washed into the marsh, and it did more damage to pull them out of the marsh than, than it did to prevent anything. And, and I'm sorry, and one of the lessons I think learned is that they've had miles and miles and miles of boom and then they didn't have skimmers. In other words, if you don't have a skimmer to come get it off the boom, you haven't gotten anywhere. You know? So it's gonna be one of these things where I think from here on out, if you got a mile of boom, you better have two skimmers. So they, they'll learn some of this, I think, from that process. And I think that, again, if, obviously if you could get it, that, that's not a bad thing. We have time for just two more. We're gonna go right here <laughs> first, right behind you. There's a microphone behind you. As a follow-up to your comment about the oil companies, the other oil companies besides BP being very upset with BP's actions. We put that microphone closer. Do you think they would be uh, some sort of uh, uh, cooperative effort between the oil industry, uh, within the oil industry, so that all of the companies essentially share the technology to respond to a situation like this in the future? <laughs> and in a sense, almost participate in, in a group that might actually specialize in this type of response. Exxon Mobil, Chevron, and Shell have already formed a consortium and put a billion dollars on the table, I'm told, to do exactly that. It's telling that, that uh, I'm sorry, Conoco, Conoco Phillips, it doesn't matter. BP's not among the three or four that did it. Um, and I, I think that uh, let them put their money where their mouth is. And even then, it still doesn't resolve some of these geographic issues, but I think that that's certainly part of it. Uh, I, I think one of the things that's going to happen uh, that I'm not sure is so good, I think, I think they're going to change the regulations. And my reaction to that is that I think you ought to, we should try to enforce, they didn't enforce what they had, and that contributed to it for sure. And, and there should certainly be better 
uh, oversight. Federal government is, is way, way delinquent in all of those issues. And our last one in the back. My name is Nathaniel Owen. I'm a Clinton School student here. Thank you, Dr. Crozier, for, uh, uh, for joining us uh, today. I have a question. It's sort of more on the policy side. After the Exxon Valdez uh, spill, which led to the OPA Act in 1990, uh, one of the uh, parts of the bill that was only partially um, incorporated uh, based on like a commission's recommendations was local citizen councils, uh, but they were only um, authorized for Alaska. It wasn't authorized throughout the United States along coastlines. And what this did uh, is basically just bring in um, local citizens and leaders to kind of help uh, be a part of the decision making about what uh, drilling practices and such uh, can take place along their coastlines. Do you think that could play a difference going forward uh, along the Gulf Coast? And have you heard any talk about uh, something like this being incorporated into any pending legislation? I, Thank you. I think that the, um, th there's been a lot of concern for the community's mental health and economic health, and there have been lots of organizers come into the communities to try to do that. I, I don't think that they have been, they haven't looked forward yet to exactly what you're talking about. They have included, it, it's interesting, this, uh, th th this oxymoron that they call the Unified Command, uh, which put the responsible party and the Coast Guard together, did include the quote, what they call the stakeholders of, of, this, of the region, and they identified uh, individuals that were asked to come in and participate, but they really didn't do it. Uh, I, I would get a call, you know, about uh, can we put boom somewhere? But instead of they weren't they weren't proactive. That's the word I was looking for. I'm getting tired. Proactive. Nobody's proactive about it. Uh, I would be a little bit reluctant to just open it up to the community because the the problem is that so much of this is very technical and you, you want an informed stakeholder, you just don't want the loudest fisherman on the, on the bayou to participate if you were going to do it. it. There's a lot of that goes on right now. So, Ladies and so, gentlemen, let's uh, give uh, Dr. Kozier a round of applause.